Ladies and gentlemen, internet, my name is Pertium, and we're talking all things Survivor Winners at War. A little bit of housekeeping before we go into this review. It's a long one. For the uninitiated, this is a video reviewing the entire season of Winners at War, discussing the events top to bottom, which means just about everything in the entire season will be spoiled. So, if you haven't seen this season and you don't want to be spoiled, I would stop watching this video right now. And if you've clicked on this video wondering if you should watch this season of Survivor, the question I have to that question is, if you're a fan of Survivor, do you really have to ask, is an all-winner season not enough to pique your interest? Regardless, I will be breaking down the season discussing the pre-merge, the post-merge, the finale, the cast, the twists, and everything in between. War is not pretty, and I'm out for blood. So, without further ado, here's my review of Survivor. Winners at War. 20 winners, 20 years in the making. Let the fireworks begin. Guns are blazing, swords are swinging, limbs and heads flying everywhere. It's gonna be a bloodbath. Yeah, there's no way Tony is getting past the premiere. <laughs> okay, there's no way Tony is getting past the tribe swap. Look, look at all those advantages. But we lost Tony. Yeah, what happened with Tony? He's not on the beat. Mm -mm. Well, okay, he'll get targeted at the merge. Can't hide in his spy shack when the votes are being read. 13th person voted out of Survivor Winners at War. Oh. Sophie, can you I bring me your torch? Pocket. Yeah, well, the rest of the cast has got to turn on him in the finale. There is no way he is logically reaching the final tribal council. The winner of Survivor Winners at War, Tony! <laughs> That was the sucker punch of a lifetime. All right, shake it off. A survivor season of all winners is over. <sighs> Breathe. Where do we start? Let's go back to the beginning. The pre-merge. I love the premiere. I expected to love the premiere. I loved it so much I dropped everything and created a completely new type of video for my channel because of it. For so many years, people were asking me to give my thoughts on the latest episode and I said, you know what? Screw it, it's season 40. Send me all your copyright claims, CBS. You can take my ad revenue, but you can't take my love for the show. While the boat ride to that little sandy key wasn't as epic as the birds rolling in on heroes versus villains, it was still great to see and honestly, I kind of love the opening moments of the show not being Jeff abandoning the players to scavenge for themselves or even a marooning where they jumped into the water like way back when, but just a small, short celebration of 40 seasons, 20 winners, and one show. It's come a long way, and whether you were here from the start or you just joined, A drink before war is always a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff for the little things. Leading up to this season, I discussed how Winners at War was going to most likely feel a lot like Game Changers and its pacing. It was going to go so fast, so hold on tight. Never mind the Edge of Extinction cutting into the airtime of the main game, we had 20 tried and tested champions all on the same beaches and you just, you just know it's gonna be an all out war. And it was. The game went fast, really fast, arguably the fastest it's ever gone right from the get go and if you're a fan of strategy, you best be pleased because I am and I was. I personally tempered my expectations, hoping for the best but bracing for a series of unfortunate events. But. I think we're in the clear. I mean, yeah, I did initially have Natalie as my May 2019 winner pick once I learned this season was going to be a thing, but hey, you know what? Someone's gotta go first. I don't think it tarnished her reputation all that much in the long run. And speaking of reputations, old school Survivor. This pre-merge <laughs> had a funny effect. Every episode I, I found was gripping. It was gripping to me, partially just due to how strong the cast was and how exciting watching them maneuver each episode turned out to be. We saw Sandra betray Rob to take out Amber, Danny just gets blown up, Ethan gets sniped, largely thanks to Jeremy and Michelle, and then Tyson gets thwomped due to that fabled preseason poker alliance. You then get to the swap and we see Rob just stubbornly stick to a strategy that just wasn't gonna hold with this cast, as well as Parvati being put in in an unwinnable situation, and then Sandra just totally nuking her game with a questionable call on giving up her idol. There is something poetic about not learning from JT so many years ago. And Yule, oh god, why? What the heck? Where did that come from? 
I almost felt like it was just sort of plucked out of the main game at random. Why couldn't they just merge one episode prior? Damn you, Edge of Extinction. No one deserves us. You know, if there's something that I or others can try to do to help them, their kids, and everyone else in that situation, I just feel like it's the least we can do. I would just love to use this opportunity to try to raise awareness of anyone who's suffering from ALS and their families who really are in need, you know, much more than any of us are. The funny thing about the pre-merge was that I was enjoying every episode in varying capacities. The double boot with Denise's queen slaying moment, <laughs> that was incredible. Tony had so many shenanigans, the ladder, running with the shark. If you haven't already, I would strongly recommend checking out the secret scenes online for this pre-merge. I was genuinely over the moon about so many of them. The hilarious antics and weird moments and interactions that this cast was having with each other. Let's do a little role play. Okay. Pretend you are Danny. I'm Danny. I don't want to put you in a tough spot right now, but tell me, are you voting for me tonight? Um, uh... Look me straight in the eyes and tell me. You're not very convincing. <laughs> I think it went all right. The first time didn't go so well, and the second time we got through it. Go off, try again, Ethan. <laughs> oh, that feels so good. I'm gonna pull my right strand here over my middle strand, like a regular braid. You will be honest. Don't flatter me. Tur let him see oh, the braids. That did, that's the first time I ever did one. Doesn't oh, it look nice. pretty good? I'm proud of myself. Which way are we going? Say so. I said I, I have faith in you, man. You're, you're, nice you're, you're one of those I told you good. so type of guys. Not your ladder. I told you so. It felt more secure than I yeah. thought. Yeah. Legitimately, I had never enjoyed myself more watching a season live in over 10 years. Each week came and went so quickly, which is kind of strange given the current climate of the world as Winners at War was airing. And yet, when the fan base, including myself, took a step back, we all let out this audible gasp at the sight before us. This pre merge was nothing if not a complete slaughter of every old school player in the cast. Was this by design? I asked myself. Was there a long con from the new school players that I just never noticed? Even before Heroes vs. Villains way back when, fans had clamored for this old school vs. new school season. Well now look at us. Read the boot order and weep. Because I kinda did. And I think from the ashes of this pre-merge, that is a great question to ask yourself as a fan of Survivor, or even Big Brother. Does a boot order determine the quality of each individual episode of the season at large? Look at Game Changers, now look at me. I'm not very high on it as a season, but I still think the pre-merge was a blast and a half in spite of its boot order from episode to episode. Can the journey be greater than the destination, or is it only the results that matter? Because watching my old school favorites go one by one was unfortunate. I did not sign up for Ethan going in episode 3, and no amount of edge scenes could make up for that feeling. But on the other hand, that's the risk that makes the potential reward all the sweeter, all the greater. Safe is just not exciting, at least not to me. The results aren't worth it if it means the journey to get to them is, I don't know, contrived, that I should be so entitled to inspect my desired outcome each episode, or at all. It's a game, after all, right? Perhaps these players going was the best avenue for the rest of them. I appreciate how much extra information the show gave us between the preseason shenanigans to explain the dynamics, to the flashbacks, to the preseason relationships that explained why players like Parvati and Yule were actually in really tough spots. Every All-Star season has a pregame and this one ran deep, almost 20 years deep and it needed to be touched upon. I enjoyed this pre-merge and what it gave us. I not only dropped everything once, but thrice to create three battle map videos just to break it all down, just to talk about the individual episodes themselves, in some ways to memorialize the unique dynamics and exciting gameplay we had before us. And as far as the edge goes, I will get to that in a minute. It stinks. I don't like it. We never got off the ground, any of us. Look at everybody here. It's all the old school players. But none of us here are quitters. We're all gonna fight to get back in this. But first, let's talk about the merge. It was chaotic. It was a battle. 
I believe we didn't get to see enough of the merged episode to better understand what really went down, but I also expected that given it was an all-star season full of complicated maneuvering on top of the edge of extinction, which took up like the first third or so of the episode. Tyson returned, which was a nice sight. I'm a big fan of Tyson, the peanut butter lord, reigned supreme, and Wendell took up the mantle as the merged boot left over by the one, the very own Chris Noble. The same man he once shut down in a very amusing voting confessional. We also had sidling Nick, which I don't think Nick appreciates, but you know what, it, it did still kind of amuse me, as well as a continued feud between Ben and Adam, or Ben and Jeremy, or just Ben and anyone it seemed. Low-key, Ben unintentionally amused me with how aggro he was. But this was a very strategy-heavy post-merge, so whenever little scenes broke out that were about the people, about their thoughts as individuals trying to cope with being a winner, being regarded as near-perfect in their minds, living up to the expectations, or just kicking it for the hell of it, throw a fashion show, do what you gotta do. I really appreciated those moments. I also really appreciated Adam trying to think at a higher level than even the producers by playing the Flor de Lis on the podium. Iconic. And you just know one day that is actually going to be an idol. It's already been an idol internationally, so it wasn't as far-fetched as you might think. And if that was an idol, and he was the target, and he needed to play it, boom, galaxy brain. You're convinced it's not? Is it? Can I play it? I want to play that. You want to play this? Yeah, can I play that? That is not a hidden immunity idol. The loved one's visit came right after. It was well and good, not exactly my cup of tea, but I know a lot of people like that. It was the loved one's visit to end all visits, and it does have that going for it. Which shouldn't happen. It's not going to happen. It's a staple for a reason, and yeah, I got very emotional. These are the people these champions are fighting for, the kids even are there. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to recognize the power of these scenes, least of all with the champion players. That said, the other half of the coin, it did take up half the episode, and then we jumped into the immunity challenge, and by the time we got back to camp, it was basically a montage of scrambling. My issue here is that I could not figure out how the heck everything fell out during this tribal. It was almost like the players had no time to strategize in real time, so the whispers became full throttle. And when most of it wasn't subtitled, I just was lost. Why were half these players just poof, suddenly on the bottom? Why are those people talking over there and these over here? It wasn't just chaotic, it was incoherent. This is one of those episodes that you kind of either love or you're whatever on for completely different reasons. So, whatever. And then Tony showed up. Took me long enough to get to Tony in this video. I mean like the strategic, I'm taking the bull by the horns, watch me wreck your favorites and route to another win, that's the Tony we're looking for. Believe it or not, Tony was very under the radar up to this point in the season, which is exactly what he touched upon in the premiere. Lower their guard just enough and then BAM, hit him with the winner edit. Sophie goes. The decoy winner for a lot of us, this episode, <laughs> this episode was wild. It was the Tony show top to bottom. And I gotta say, a lot of times, I really don't care for episodes that are entirely dominated by just one person, largely because that person doesn't always deserve to suck up every bit of airtime, making everyone else come across like NPCs, like the red shirts, like extras on the set. But between getting extorted, to winning immunity, to finding an idol, to gathering a boatload of fire tokens, to pulling off the biggest blindside of the season, regardless of who that person was, whether it was Tony or anyone else, that amount of screen time, in my opinion, for this one episode was earned. And I respect that. I respect the hustle. I respect everything he accomplished here. Winning immunity, physical. Gathering tokens, social. Blindsiding his biggest threat, tactical. Me, Jeremy, Nick, Michelle. Because that four is stronger than their three and their two. So I'm going to be golden if I can pull this off. And it wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't just because. It wasn't intended to be this resume builder. It was a big move that made sense. And I applaud that. He knew he could get away with it, and I love me a crazy 4-3-2 plurality vote. We also then had the evolution in the spy technology with the spy nest, trademarked and patented. And given Tony made that crazy Sophie move, we now had pushback with Kim rallying the troops to take him out. And this was one of my favorite showdowns in 40 seasons of the show. Two of the top tier winners going at it without directly making it obvious. You will never see this level of competition so head to head. And I'm just happy Kim was able to find a footing, reverse her role, and put some heat on Tony for what he was doing. People will say Tony became the obvious winner after his final nine move. He faced no opposition, but he definitely did. 
Likewise, we had him cutting Jeremy in that 3-2-2 to two to two vote right away with Michelle and her giving Jeremy the coin, then getting it back, her little yes, and then squarely finding herself yet again on the outs. I very much enjoyed the double boot episode that spanned two hours. Again, I never felt like these episodes were lacking. They were rife with strategy and moves, but also character moments that span the season, relationships that made sense, were fleshed out for the most part, and I was enjoying it. That Tony and Jeremy scene with the calendar, one of my favorite conversations. 10 days is two weeks. 14 days is two weeks. No, I work five days a week. But you're not getting any days off. You're not going home on the weekend. Right? I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm on a vacation. What are you doing right now? We're working. I'm on vacation. We're working right no, now. No, it's not working. We're talking about strategy. That said, I gotta say it woefully underrepresented Denise this season. I know she's more of a quiet, under the radar player, but. But man, was she underreported. Which, okay, it's actually what happened in the season that she won, too. So a part of me wonders if this is just how it is with her. Which is also segueing into the finale. Yeah, I enjoyed this finale. Of course, they began with the Edge return challenge. The return challenge to start the finale really hit hard and was probably the only time I was really thankful that we had the Edge. I've never been a huge fan of the EOE twist, but in the case of Winners at War, thematically, narratively, it was pretty good. This ending was poignant. It was profound. Getting to hear from Amber, from Kim, from Ethan, all of them as the cap off to their survivor journeys at the end of the ultimate season of the show, ooh, I get goosebumps. I had goosebumps. From where the season began with 20 hopefuls, fresh faces, ready to play the ultimate game, to the very end, day 35, this is it. I kinda got why The Edge could exist on this season alone. I'm a sucker for a good story, and I think having so many multi-season arcs end here in a very heartfelt, insightful way, it worked for me. I went into this finale expecting Tony to win. Kinda like in Heroes vs. Villains with Sandra, I expected that, but I didn't know if it would really happen. Where I was rooting for Parvati way back when, but not expecting her to pull out the dub, I was delightfully surprised to see the player who I believe encapsulated the season and the game the most take it all. I've also never been a huge fan of this fire-making twist from six seasons ago, said it three years ago and it still holds true, but dear God, my heart was racing when it came down to Tony versus Sarah, and I was kinda rooting for Tony, and the fire was not going his way. My heart nearly couldn't take it, and at that point, I legitimately believed, in spite of all of my analysis, my gut feeling, my predictions from very early on, everything, just like Parvati 10 years ago, Tony wasn't winning after all. I had been bamboozled. But then he won, <laughs> and it was so emotional. Hey, endure this. You got one more day you're done. So it's so man. Don't apologize. I'm not gonna say sorry. If I was gonna go out of this game, that's how I wanted to go out. And if I wanted someone to take me out, that's who I wanted to take me out. I wish I could be there with them. You know, we talked about this for the last 38 days. Um, it's not gonna happen, but it's okay. And he can still finish what he set out to accomplish. That end of Cops Are Us, ugh, so earned. Over the span of three seasons, that alliance is now three for three. Good luck topping it. We did have Ben kind of throwing in the towel right beforehand, which I'm kind of 50-50 on because on one hand, I didn't think Ben stood a good chance to win, so it kind of left the door open for a more exciting ending, which I appreciated, a more competitive final tribal. But then also it's like, Ben, it's the final five of all winners. Go for broke, man. But I kind of suspect that he knew his goose was cooked anyway. So from a personal viewpoint, from one friend to another, he really bonded with Sarah, I think more than anyone that season, and he wanted to lift that burden off her knowing the inevitable was coming. I get it. And a part of me is cool with that because, you know, these are people, not pieces made of plastic, and the psychological and emotional toil can get heavy, and it's something I will likely never experience myself being in those shoes. Also, major props to Michelle for managing to survive at the bottom pretty much for like the entire post-merge. Gosh, so impressive being such an underdog and getting that far in a season with the highest caliber of competition you'll ever see. I know people are gonna give her flack for her game, but let's be real, it's still an impressive feat regardless of what happened. And then lastly, for the finale, let's talk about the end of it all. The final tribal council, Natalie, Michelle, and Tony and the pouring rain. Man, did that rain just put a damper on their mood or what? Probably not the most exciting final tribal ever, but you know what, it was enough. I still do think, as the edge returnee, which is an important qualifier here, that Natalie should have thrown herself into the fire making challenge against Tony. I actually think she wins that, though I'm not sure if she beats Sarah at that final three, but I think there is a slightly better chance 
clearly than against Tony. People tend to forget that Tony didn't have a great performance at the final two of Kageon. His game spoke for himself and gave him that win by that point. His final travel performance was a little more humble this time around, and I think that was the right tone to take. He wasn't overstating himself. He didn't have this heightened sense of self-appreciation. Tony's mindset has always been to be great and just let others remark upon it as they see fit. If they love it, they love it. Greatness will speak for itself. If it's not great, they will decide that. Michelle, meanwhile, was a bit on the outside as per usual, and I felt pretty dang bad, but okay, it's a game here, it happens. I do find it highly amusing that after Ko Rong, there was a massive debate in the Survivor community, one of the biggest ever for why Michelle maybe deserved second, and now, after her second appearance, making it 39 days yet again without getting voted out, the debate is now centered on if Michelle deserved second yet again, for different reasons. Poetic. My first time, I really struggled with like some of the backlash that I got. For what? Well, my win was super controversial. I went four years feeling like I might not have deserved to win my first season. And every single day and every decision that I make, I'm proving it that I deserve it this time and I deserved it that time. Speaking of poetry, Natalie went on to imbue the spirit of her 20, Nadia, the first boot of their first season. Natalie both gets voted out first and then reaches the final tribal, nearly winning bookending the season just the same as before. Does history repeat itself? But there's more than that. Look at Ben, whose life depended upon finding an idol at the final five, and yet, unlike in his first season, he couldn't. He searched high and low, and nope, can't dig here, Ben. Or Tony, an OG Braun tribe member who won no immunities in his first game, yet went on to win four this time around. Who saw that coming? Or Danny, the most invisible winner in Survivor history, goes on to a season of all winners and remains the most invisible winner in Survivor history, huzzah! Sarah, or is it Lucina now, who began her Survivor adventure loyal to Cops R Us, potentially to her detriment, ultimately finishes her Survivor adventure loyal to that same alliance, to the bittersweet end. Jeremy becomes the meat shield for an even bigger player who utilizes his own strategy against him. Kim, who I believe played the most dominant win of any first timer, comes back and plays almost entirely powerless from the bottom all season, and yet, still manages to go the distance. Yule recreates a dominant four-person alliance only to then have it be his own undoing this time around instead of the reason he would go deep. Wendell, who voted out Chris Noble at the merge of Ghost Island, disses Chris for his rap at the time as he votes him out, only to then show up at Winners at War, get voted out as the same merge boot this time around, and he shows up at Ponderosa singing the lyrics that Chris Noble penned when he first arrived four seasons prior. Living a dream, I'm Ponderosa. Swung for the fences, I call it Sammy Sosa. Living my dream, I'm Ponderosa. Swung for the fences, I call it Sammy Sosa. And Adam, went full superfan. Hey, is it worth a shot? Always. That list of small things is not even the half of it. There's a lot more that can be said that I loved about Winners at War that filled in the details, the cracks within the episodes that you might not entirely notice if you aren't looking for them. The rewatchability of this season, I think, is going to be really high. Winners at War was the culmination of 20 years of television, of gameplay, of storytelling, of narrative arcs, and while it didn't touch upon everything, it did still give us a lot. And I am forever grateful, because I truly believe it hit it out of the park when it very easily could have hit a fly ball to center field. You couldn't go wrong with this cast, and I expected that, and I think all of them brought it in their own way. Did some of them impress me more than others? Absolutely. Some players played the game better, maybe I'll go into more detail about that down the line, but there was a little bit of something for everyone, and I think the season overall deserves the praise it'll get as we wrap it all up and move forward. Which, of course, brings me to the last little bits of this review, discussing the twists giving what I believe should be considered constructive criticism. Every season is a few twists, and Winners at War went quite big. Edge of Extinction. Nope. Sorry, Jeff. I know you like it. I appreciate your creative passion to push the boundaries, dig deeper, go harder in the paint than ever before. <sighs> but I don't like the edge any more than I did two seasons ago, and the best news I've heard in the past three months was how EOE was not returning anytime soon. That said, I did like the end of The Edge in the finale. I thought it was a fantastic payoff, which leaves me very conflicted because with no reunion, an understandable call, we likely never get that ending for so many of the winners. And The Edge gave us that. And I think that was somewhat worth it, that one final scene. 
It was an exciting way to start the finale, and I think that's a major pro in the twist's corner. There are two main issues I have with the Edge of Extinction, the first being airtime. It's been the biggest ask from the community since I think season 38, but man, if you're gonna include the Edge with so many players, so many stories, like a giant ever-growing blob of fan favorites, it would have been great to give us 90-minute episodes each week. I know it's a big ask, but damn it, this is a big season. Who do I gotta talk to on the phone to make that happen? Because I went and watched the secret scenes online, and while they gave me a little more of what I wanted, I could only imagine what more we could have received when I know there's more to show us if only we had the time. Yum. 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 Okay, that's what I was hoping you were gonna say. Yum. Yum. <laughs> The Edge is not just a replacement for a reward challenge each episode, it's an entirely different game being played alongside the main game, and if you're gonna sell us a winner from that side, from the loser's bracket, we need to see it, or else we wind up very underwhelmed and confused when the narrative has the rug pulled out from underneath us, come the finale with Chris Underwood beating the frontrunner to win, or Natalie doing the same thing. Except, that's the underlying flaw. Perhaps there just isn't much to show. It's kind of an insane comparison to make, the edge to the main game. The jury is voting between two different shows, which brings me to my second main issue. The edge is a way less compelling, watered down version of the survivor we all know and love of the main game. Winners at War tried to make it more of a game, with the advantages and the fire tokens and less of just a kumbaya purgatory, but it still didn't deliver for me. From a game perspective, it's an intrusive mechanic that can cripple the players still in the main game who are playing it well. Heck, with the fire tokens in play, it's actually advantageous to get there first as you will accrue more tokens sooner, make more friends as they leave the main game and bunk with you for the next 33 days and potentially influence the game with whatever advantages or disadvantages you find along the way. It shouldn't be better to do worse. That makes no sense. The edge is incredibly imbalanced to an egregious degree and if we're here to watch the best play, why can't we see that? Because they aren't shown, because we need to see those who lost sit on a beach, stare into the sunset, climb a hill 40 times, despite all of us knowing only one of them is returning by the end, the rest aren't even going to be in the equation. To me, the edge never earned its keep, its value, it still hasn't even after two whole seasons, even with the best of the best on it. From a story perspective, which I think is what Jeff was getting at with this twist, it's a different story, sorta. It's the reason I'm willing to accept it with Winners at War, despite believing it also wasn't needed. Getting 20 specific players of a small pool of people isn't easy, and I think from a producer's standpoint, it's understandable why having a massive safety net built into the season can be a saving grace. I did enjoy seeing Rob have that well-edited gotcha moment where he found a bunch of tokens It was the next step in storytelling that Survivor usually doesn't stray far from. I love the way that scene was edited. Does it look like this? No. You promise you don't have I any? I promise, dude. The consensus is that the other three fire tokens were never found by anyone. You don't have anything? I have nothing. The thing is, all of these people have no idea that I have the fire tokens. They believe that I wasn't the one to the first of any trails. But I was, bro. If these edge challenges, climbing up hills, collecting coconuts, whatever, if they are replacing reward challenges, it's kind of okay to see the players doing something as opposed to doing nothing two seasons ago. Even though I do think it kind of went a little overboard with the Ethan collapse. Seriously, Ethan, oh man, I felt so bad. I hope you made honey with that single fire token. The Edge did give us more of the people so many of us wanted to continue to see. But then on the other side of that 50-50 coin, I wondered what were we missing in the main game where ultimately that's kind of what I'm here to watch. A show about the struggles of surviving in a very political social game out in the wilderness. The Edge just doesn't have all that in the end, even though it tried with the fire tokens. Which brings me to the fire tokens. I think they have been somewhat well received, more so than the Edge anyway. I didn't like how unknown they were, what value they really brought to the game. With champions playing, they were all kind of confused on how to play with them. We saw Sandra blow up her game, for just one, <laughs> one fire token. It's kind of laughable when you get to the end of the season. But then Tony, a few episodes later, has to collect six out of the blue, otherwise he loses his vote and can't win immunity. What? As fun as the extortion episode was, that twist could have been nuclear. Leave it to Tony to disarm that bomb, 
But nonetheless, that was one of my least favorite disadvantages I have ever seen in all of Survivor or Big Brother. It was that bad. And Tony didn't even know where his tokens were going after he paid them. Kind of like Jamal finding a disadvantage on a stick, the RNG is absurd and it hurts the season in my eyes. Similar to Dean getting an idol nullifier for flipping a coin just to blast Janet to Kingdom Come at the final five. Stop. Stop it, Survivor. Put the sugar down. That said, the fire tokens have potential. If you've ever seen the South Korean show called The Genius, I would strongly recommend checking it out. They have a currency similar to fire tokens called Garnets, and they pretty much function as a tool to be leveraged to buy advantages and challenges or to curry favor from other players, but they're also worth money at the end of the season, so the more of them that you hold, the more money you get if you win. Spending them in the short term can go against you in the long run, assuming you do win because you just blew a lot of cash and maybe whatever advantage you bought wasn't needed. I won't turn this review into a think tank, but I would love to see how this new twist, the fire tokens, could be molded for future seasons because there is room to grow, and that's always a good start. So, okay, that was my constructive criticism, and those were the down points of the season. Winners at War, it wasn't perfect, but it gave me just about everything I wanted to the point where I am really, I'm really just sitting here asking for more. I'm happy with what I got, and can I have another, please? Somehow. This was a strong season of Survivor, and one of the best seasons to feature returning players, and like I've said before, I'm thankful for it existing and how it turned out. From you guys, I wanna know what you all thought about Winners at War. Where would it rank for you against the rest of the series, the seasons that you've seen? How did you feel about it? And where in the world, not literally, is Survivor going next? With no new season on the horizon just yet, the first time ever in 40 seasons, this is unprecedented. I still plan to make videos every week. I may switch to Big Brother for the summer down the line, we will see, but either way, I'm holding my breath. Survivor will come back with a vengeance, and I do believe it'll be the start of a new era of the show. I think Winners at War was the end of another chapter. One very meta chapter that went in a lot of directions, almost entirely set in one location, Fiji, dividing itself by casting themes and big twist themes, changing the way the game is played season by season. For some, it's gone too fast. For others, it's been just enough. I think this era of the show was arguably the biggest shift it has ever had, and I don't think it's so bad in the end. It's just different. Unusual, maybe. In the end, just as when I first began so many years ago, I'm still here for it. Still loving it. Still kicking it. And I can't wait to see where we go next. From one super fan of Survivor to another, thank you guys for being along for the ride. I'm gonna bring everything but honesty, honor, integrity, loyalty. I like Tony, but I don't think Tony can win this game because I don't think Tony's going to be able to relate to people in the way they need to be related to. Bang, bang.